the uh, software engineering manager at LinkedIn, and she's going to talk about the perks and pitfalls of data-driven development. Um, they have a ton of data over at LinkedIn, and uh, we were talking about it on the phone. Sometimes it's a blessing and sometimes it's a curse uh, to have that much data. So she's going to tell us a little bit about that. Um, so Neha loves to work on technology that empowers users and uplifts society. She possesses a strong sense of ownership and passion when it comes to her work. She thrives on collaboration, loves to mentor others, excels at communicating and empathizing uh, with folks in different roles, and she's successfully led and delivered multiple uh, key projects in, in her different roles. Um, she's very passionate about software development and building products tailored towards amazing user experience and is a, a big advocate of diverse teams. Uh, Neha was named uh, top 10 women in cloud for 2017. She loves to engage in public speaking and has presented at various conferences, including Conference of uh, Engineering Diversity in 2017 and San Jose State University, where she was a keynote speaker. She loves to travel, read books, write poetry, and experiment in the kitchen. And with that, I'm going to hand it over to Neha. Hello, people. Thanks for the amazing introduction uh, and for organizing this event and having me. Uh, this is a pretty sweet, intimate crowd, and I really was engaging with a lot of you back there earlier and would love to talk to you guys later. So send me an email. Imagine you're in a meeting with product, design, and marketing leads. You're the engineering leader. The big question for today's meeting is whether to paint that badging icon red or blue. How many of you have been in such big meetings where you're discussing a really obscure question, a bizarre question, you really don't care about it. Well, a lot of you, okay. So people on the red side are very staunch believers of the fact that red is a color of prominence and grabs attention. And that is probably the reason why all the stop signs are red, right? While on the blue side, the main theme is that blue invokes a feeling of being relaxed, liberal, why else would all the logos of the major software companies be some shade of blue? The meeting is at an impasse, as you all might recall, when someone suggests, let's use data to decide. And then, because you are the engineering leader, so all the eyes turn towards you. Hi, uh, I'm Neha Jain. These days, I manage an engineering team within LinkedIn Talent Solutions, which builds products for our job posters to make them more efficient and effective at hiring talent for their open positions. We've built a product called Recommended Matches, which suggests qualified candidates to the job poster based on the information that we extract from the job post's information. For example, title, location, industry, skills. This product learns and improves the results in real time based on the feedback that we collect from the user. So if the user says that this candidate that is being recommended by the algorithm is a good fit for the role, we'll show more candidates like that. Versus if they say that it's not a fit for this role, then we'll try to learn from that and show less of the candidates with those uh, skills and those industries. On any day, we are running four to five A-B tests. We are ramping new features that make our customers more productive. And we are refining our hypotheses that are based on the data that we collected from the failed experiments to design new features. Tonight, I plan to share examples of many such experiments and how at LinkedIn, we collect and use data to inform our decisions. Before we start, I've already taken a quick poll. So as uh, all of you people in those meetings, a lot of you don't care about the color of the icon. I'm going to argue that although it is a product or design decision, as engineers, you need to at least care about it because we are product owners by virtue of being the ones who build these products. At the end of the day, Based on that decision, your code is going to have a lot of if-else conditions. Your code is going to become really difficult to maintain and debug, scale, and would lead, to, would lead to low velocity of shipping code and eventually low morale of the team. Being an agile developer doesn't mean that you accumulate a bunch of tech debt, but it is rather about building systems so that we can ship code fast and quickly set up experiments randomly assigning users different variations of the same features, and then reliably tracking their behavior to select the best option. So in order to practice data-driven development, we need to collect data. How the user is using the product, are they finding success from interacting with the product? First time, so much so that they would like to come back to the product. So the screenshot here is uh, the screenshot of the recommended matches product that we've built. So we show you 
the candidate's profile. We tell you why the candidate is a good fit for this role. So we'll tell you the summary. We'll show that, oh, they say that they, they mark they're open for a new opportunity. And then they've been following your company since like, uh, since four years. So they are pretty interested in this role and you should consider reaching out to them. Now, uh, the product usage, how we track product usage for our product is that we track engagement based on the number of profiles that have been viewed and the number of messages that have been sent to the candidates and how many candidates have been rated, whether as good fit or not fit or uh, been passed on and uh, how many times the user comes back and logs in, so the login frequency. Um, now, to measure growth, that is tricky. So let's take an example. Say that your product has 20 users and each of them pay $2 uh, to use your product. Now, you could one way grow the product by scaling it to 20 more users or by increasing revenue $4 per user. So in both of those situations, the outcome is $80 of revenue. So they are even in that way. One is leading to the increased number of user signups and the other one is leading to increased revenue generation per user. Which one is good? We don't know. Because both of these leave out one important piece. Is the product actually working for the user? So sustainable growth, if you are just measuring growth from revenue or number of signups, is not going to come. Because eventually users will realize that, oh, this product is not working for me. And then they're like, oh, they're just charging like $2 or $4. I'm not even going to pay a single dollar for this service. So they're going to churn out. An important thing about growth is that we marry it with customer satisfaction. So it's important that we measure customer satisfaction as well. How do you measure customer satisfaction? That's difficult. At LinkedIn, we use something called Net Promoter Score. How that works is it's a very simple one question which asks whether the product is working for you and are you enthusiastic enough to recommend it to your friend? And that tells you whether the product is working for them, whether they are a staunch advocate of your product and are going to stay with the product for a longer time. So that's something that we do for measuring uh, growth, customer satisfaction and product usage for our recommended matches product. But now the thing is that you have a lot of metrics and a lot of data as I just pointed out. So it's great to collect all of that data to gauge the health of the product. But when you are in those big meetings and you're trying to decide whether or not to color uh, that icon red or blue, that data is going to only lead to a lot more discussions and not a solution, which is why we need to have one metric, which is co usually called the true north metric or the north star metric that can help us resolve those discussions by pointing out not just the current importance of customer satisfaction or growth, but actually tying it back to the company's vision and quantifying company's vision, which will capture, which we'll capture into a metric is important to measure progress of the company, whether we are moving forward or we are even moving closer to our goal. So in terms of defining success of the product at LinkedIn, we measure the success of our users using the product by using the num by using the number of hires that they make as a result of using our product. That actually ties in well with our LinkedIn's vision and customer success. If, you're, if you recall, the LinkedIn's vision is creating economic opportunity for every member of the global workforce. What that means is we have to define what economic opportunity is. It could be as simple as getting a job or to build your brand as an influencer and then tying it back the global workforce and connecting them. Now that we've established that we have to care about these decisions and we have set up the system to collect the data, we've also defined our true north, let's run some A-B tests. In a good A-B test, it's important that only one hypothesis is being validated. As I'll show later, if too many variables are being tested in one product, in one experiment, it leads to a lot more discussions, a lot more heated debates. Because it is difficult to attribute the result of the experiment back to which part of that experiment was working. Now, a design, uh, which 
a design which meets the user where they are and is also intuitive enough for the users generally will outperform any other design that requires onboarding or that requires explanation. That is also something that we learn. So here, if you'll see, this is one example of the A-B test, a real example that we uh, ran for our product. Uh, there are two buttons. One says interested and the other one says one click message. What these buttons do is when you click on interested, okay, anybody wants to take a guess? What these buttons do? Sure. Button A um, allows me to let the app know that I'm interested. Okay. And button B? No idea. <laughs> Same thing. Sending a message program. This is, okay, this, this has been a very revealing or uh, interesting exercise for me to do here. So what we found is something a little bit different. I think a lot of us here are uh, engineering crowd. Uh, am I right with that? So uh, it makes sense for, you, for us all to say that interested does what you just said. Um, it wasn't very clear to our users of our product because most of our users who are posting jobs at LinkedIn are not essentially from tech crowd. So they don't also understand that when you're clicking on any of these buttons and there's a machine learning going on or like there is some online uh, in real time, the suggestions are going to change or anything like that is going to happen. What Interested was doing in this case is when you click on it, it would send a message, a templated message to the job seeker whose, candidate, whose profile you were reviewing, letting them know that you are interested in them. And uh, one click message also does the same thing. Uh, it sends the message to the seeker saying that you're interested in them. Now, the reason we changed the verbiage or we were even running this experiment was that interested was confusing to the users. They were not expecting that it would send a message to the seeker uh, on their behalf. They were like, oh, what? What did you just do? And we were getting a lot of customer complaints because of that. A funny thing had happened that the time that we had ran the first experiment where we had introduced the button interested, we had actually introduced four variables at the same time in that experiment. And our customer feedback loop was broken. Don't tell anyone about that. We fixed it. So we were not getting any customer complaints. And as expected that this button was just showing like huge growth in our metrics because a lot of people were clicking on it thinking that it is going to shortlist these candidates into one bucket but not let them know that they were interested in them. Uh, so they kept on clicking on them that, oh, okay, I'm interested in them, I'm interested in them, and I'll review them later and I'll then send them a message but instead messages were going and then they were like custom, like seekers replying that, oh yes, I'm excited in this role and like, and then they were like, what just happened? So that was one of the reasons why we were changing or testing this out that, okay, is this more clearer? So precedent of one click message is with one click buy at Amazon, which essentially like if you click on it, it automatically charges your credit card and buys the thing that you're looking there. So this, as we'll see, the result of the experiment was that there were 10% of to less total messages being sent. Why was that? Because now the users knew what the button does. So they were not clicking on it because they don't want to send messages to the candidate. They were just shortlisting. So they just wanted to like go through their business of the day and then figure out whether they want to send a message or not, whether they want to reach out or not. But we were seeing that there was some downtick in the customer issues that were coming in. Now, intuitively, we all trust this data. Because as I've set the stage, if this is more clear, then it's leading to less customer issues. And it's also leading to less messages being sent. But the thing here is the data in itself can be biased. If you don't understand the data properly, then you will not ramp this experiment because you'll think that, oh, the advantage that we are getting in terms of customer understanding and intuitiveness is not as much because see, like it's just 1%. But what you see here with the number of messages being sent, it's down 10%. That's like a big drop. We cannot take it. That's confirmation bias, where you know that something is true. So you are trying to find evidence that supports your original belief. 
Similarly, you could also have selection bias, where although these experiments randomly send users into different buckets, bucket A or bucket B, it's possible for some reason the users in bucket A are more engaged with the product, have higher intention of hiring even before they were assigned into that bucket versus the users that get assigned to bucket B. Because we have a whole spectrum of users using LinkedIn jobs where someone could be an actual startup founder who's trying to like hire for this role and want somebody to start tomorrow versus somebody who's a recruiter and is okay with like going and checking with their boss before sending a message and like before getting the, uh, before calling the person in for the interview and then hiring them and it could take anywhere between three to six months and that's totally fine for them. So how do you account for that? And that's the reason for selection bias. For some reason, how the users were selected and put into each of these buckets is not as random as you would think. It's not a result of chance, but rather something that is broken in the way that this is happening. And similarly, the other bias that could happen is outlier bias. There are a ton of other bias. There's a book called Art of Biases, uh, which I'd encourage you guys to read. I'm just covering the top three, which we used uh, to rather go back and refine the results and refine the data. The outlier bias is something where you have a high variance in the usage of your data. So you have users, some users will be like sending 10 messages in one session versus other users are like more thoughtful. They'll spend like 10 minutes on each profile and are only sending one or two messages or something like that. So there's a high variance in your data. So you have outliers and what outliers generally do is that they hide what the average or the majority users do. And when you have small numbers, then the, res the action of the outliers can overshadow whatever is happening by the majority users. So what we did is we removed all these three things from uh, all these biases from our data and then redid the readout again. So we removed the total num from the messages that were being sent, how many of them were accidental messages because the button was deceptive to the users and they were accidentally clicking on them versus how many of the messages were being sent intentionally. How we did that, anybody wants to take a guess? How did we remove the accidental messages from the data? How did we figure that out? Uh, say that again? By WTF reply. <laughs> um, that's, that's, that's one way. Yeah, it's, it's something uh, you're more on the uh, warmer side. So basically, if you're sending just one message in one session and not coming back uh, to sending the message, then we remove those users from uh, the bucket because it's not intentional and you accidentally clicked on it. Uh, the thing with uh, the option that you suggested is that a lot of times, only very, very passionate users will send you a, a customer ticket back. Not everyone sends you a, a request back saying that your product is not working. So it works, but not always. Um, so uh, that's something that we did. So we uh, fixed our confirmation bias problem. We also removed, when we were looking at the customer issues, we started looking at them in a, a sectional way. So in a topical way. So basically if the customer issues were more towards this functionality specifically, because a lot of pieces of the product are not working. So there can be like a lot of customer issues. So the fact that in total customer issues, also it was showing a 1% dip was huge. Like this is something that the users were really, really uh, worried about and were concerned something that was not working for them. So when we looked at just this specific uh, section, we were seeing an 80% drop. And uh, all these numbers have been a little bit exaggerated for the effect. And so therefore illustration only. But the question that has not been answered so far in what I've been talking about is what happened to our true north? That's the most important question. Like all these things are important and they are sending you in the right direction. They are showing you the right, uh, pointing you in the right paths, sometimes, sometimes not. But the true north is something that will show you whether or not the changes are having effect. So when we fixed for the accidental messages being sent, and when we fixed for um, the outliers, we removed the outliers from the equation, 
Then we saw that the messages that were intentional and mindfully being sent to the candidates, they were getting responses back from the job poster as well. So that was leading to hiring conversations. And what a good hiring conversation leads to is hiring outcomes. So that was actually moving our needle for the true north. So eventually we ended up ramping uh, that other bucket B. So that is why you saw the first uh, slide. In summary, I want to leave you with three key takeaways. Define your true north before setting up any experiments. Because after the fact, it's not going to be clear. It's going to be very subjective. Talk to the users and understand your product's vision and the problem that you're trying to solve to identify the metric that captures what success would mean for this product and also aligns with your company's vision. Then build new designs and try them out with real users. Try user experience research as fast as possible to collect the ground truth in product adoption and usage. Don't try to cram several variations of one in one experiment. The value of running simple experiments which test and validate one hypothesis at a time is critical for data-driven decisions. And finally, use your data to inform your decisions, but be aware that data has limits and is prone to the same human biases if not understood carefully. Thank you. Hi there, great presentation, really enlightening on A and B testing. I, my name is Leo Jans. I am uh, VP of engineering at a healthcare startup called Apixio. Um, you know, when you talked about that meeting about the blue and the red button, you talked about data collection, but there's two other things in my experience which is needed to make the decision. So the first question is, do we need more data, which you kind of answered a good way. And the second one is, do we have a decision maker in the room? And there's a third one, there's a third one, which is, um, if not, can we make a decision right now? And that uh, has been in my experience where we have debated the blue versus red ad, ad nausea. And, and we don't need more data, we just need the courage to make decisions. So just wanna compliment with a, that back to that meeting that yes, even if you have this data, do you make the decision then, you know, document it and move forward? Because in engineering, we wanna, we want to decide which button we put and not change the color after that. So just my comment on that. That's so true. I, I, <laughs> I'd, like to just, uh, I'd like to just add to that. So at LinkedIn, what we follow is something called rapid, where uh, in order to resolve these conflicting situations and to like de-escalate the situation, we have people who are responsible and accountable for that decision, but we have one decision maker. Uh, in most of the cases, it's product. But as it happens sometimes, which happened with a lot of our meetings also, the product person doesn't have the time to attend the meeting or is on some kind of DTO or vacation, in which case the philosophy we follow is disagree and commit. So we just, it's okay that you don't agree with this design or like it just doesn't make sense to you, but we commit to it, we move forward, and then let's see what happens in the future. So it's like, just make the call and move forward rather than spending endless hours <laughs> talking about it and not making a decision. I have a, thank you. I have a series of funny questions. Uh, how many people- Do you want me to answer those? Yes, please. So uh, how many people were involved in deciding the change of this little caption on the button? Uh, how many man hours will spend total uh, on that uh, challenge? And how did it even come to be that you have this, had this challenge? Uh, as I started earlier, it, it, it is a very, uh, it, it is a decision that if you try to put it in terms of our salaries in a way that like the number of hours that were spent and then like, it was a very expensive experiment, this one in particular, uh, but it also led to a lot of learnings on the way because we realized that there are stakeholders in every decision. And if you don't include them in the decision-making process early on, then they feel left out. A lot of the times, the crux of making a decision and then having a happy team is to make sure that everyone feels heard. Those were some of the key takeaways for us. Uh, so in that respect, this was a fruitful experiment to run. 
Um, yeah. Did it help? Do you have more questions? Yes. Uh, okay, we'll get back to you. So do you have other questions in the room? Okay. Hey, um, I have more like a general question. Um, since we were talking about uh, composition like uh, of the setters and so on, I would be more interested about like what the team looks like and what's the scope looks like that you're you're tackling, just to get a better understanding. Also, like what what a the product team basically at LinkedIn looks like, just from the general side. Is, uh, we have a small team. And uh, we have somewhere around like eight to 10 engineers. Something that we've done with this particular product is we have a lot of application engineers working on machine learning. So as you, as I was explaining about the product, the recommended matches product, it's heavily based on machine learning because we have to improve the results based on the user feedback. So we are doing online learning uh, in real time. And uh, that's difficult because a lot of machine learning, as you guys might be aware of, happens offline. So uh, putting it all in real time uh, to incorporate the user feedback is not easy. And it takes a lot of uh, engineering uh, work in the infrastructure to make that work. So, uh, but we have a very small team where we encourage all our application engineers to work on machine learning as well as machine learning engineers to work on applications. So it's a very cohesive team in that way. We have a product manager and we have uh, a marketing partner and a design partner who help work uh, and improve the product uh, as we go. Sometimes we do uh, tie in back with our user research team to try and test out various designs before uh, building them out because it's important that we at least get some qualitative uh, feedback on uh, the feature that we're trying to build before like putting in all man hours to build it out and then try to collect the data. So the art of prototyping there. Um, in uh, particular, the challenges that we are trying to solve right now are in terms of uh, preventing biases to get into uh, the decision making or our algorithm and uh, improving our algorithm as we go uh, to generate candidates which make more sense for these people uh, who are reviewing them and uh, also expanding this product across to all of the LinkedIn uh, recruiter product suites as well as uh, making sure that the feedback that we are capturing is shared across all the products so that everything improves and it's not that you are in one part of the LinkedIn ecosystem where you're recruiting, but then in the other part where you are job seeking and we are not learning from it. So you are, uh, so those are like some challenges that we're trying to solve. But yeah, uh, send me a, shoot me an email or something uh, to learn more. Okay. We'll take those two and then come back to you. Do you have, do we have time? Yeah, yeah, we're good. Okay. Any more questions? Great. Uh, my name is Mark Moglin. I'm with uh, Sigmoid. We're a big data startup with an ad tech product. Um, I, I'm curious how you think about metrics. So you mentioned the metric, the key metric of uh, what, the number of hires that an employer makes. Are there any other like sub metrics which might lead up to that, you know, in order for you to make decision making around what to test? And if it's not directly hitting that one metric, how do you gauge whether it's a test worthwhile or not? That's a great question. So as I was uh, leading up to the True North metric, I was talking about uh, engagement metrics, user engagement metrics, and uh, product growth metrics, customer satisfaction. So those are the metrics that directionally lead toward the True North metric. And a lot of times what we see when we're running experiments is that the impact on the True North metric is not uh, bad, but it's not good either. In which case, like, we have to figure out whether this experiment was worthwhile or not and like move forward and ramp it or not ramp it. In those cases, what we try to look at is the engineering cost. So a lot of times when we are building uh, new features, we try to like build them in a scrappy way. Uh, not a lot of times, but sometimes. Uh, and then we also have to look into the fact that, okay, if we ramp this experiment, then what is going to be the downward impact of uh, this on our code and uh, on the other products that we have, whether it aligns with them. So if it is not impacting the true north metric in any uh, monumental way, then those are the costs that we consider before ramping the experiment. 
So it seems like when you're A-B testing, you inherently have to dissatisfy a group of customers. And my question was, is do you have a mechanism in place for all of the people that don't like the new feature? Like, do you filter them out or do they stay in the cycle or what, what happens to those people? That's a very fantastic question. That's something that you'll see also in real life. Like a lot of times, you may not agree with everything that your friend or your like your spouse or your family or your like parents are saying, and but you don't leave them. So uh, that's basically what we do. Like if a lot of users are really really upset about something that we launched, which in this case they were, we fixed it. It took us a lot of time. Like I think uh, you were asking that question earlier, like how many man hours it took. Uh, it was worthwhile because it was driving customer satisfaction and customers feel, felt heard. So um, in such cases, we try to like do that. Uh, but in other cases, sometimes users will not be satisfied. And we just say that it's okay and we part ways. So yeah, there you go. Uh, two more questions. Let's say we- Two more questions, great job. Yes, thank you. Um, uh, in case of your experiment wasn't success, uh, do you actually roll back the code uh, first? Um, and second, uh, do you have any kind of canary uh, testing for uh, all your release if you see something's going real bad? So, uh, so I'll talk about the development uh, cycle that we have at LinkedIn first, like your second question first. So we have uh, a continuous integration, continuous delivery thing where uh, when you are working on the code, you can test it in something that we uh, call uh, a staging environment where like it's, it's like production, but it's not fully production. Uh, we uh, have that environment that can be emulated on your own development machine. So you can test everything out on your machine, be confident that it, it works before committing it. Because when you commit the code, it will go out to production and will uh, be there for all the users. Uh, so you have to be careful of what you're putting in. You have to test it properly. You have to get it code reviewed and everything like that. Once it is deployed to production, every new feature and new things that we are building, we put it behind a feature flag that we call Lix that helps us with all this experimentation and data collection. So um, the code doesn't directly impact the real users uh, because it is behind a feature flag, which we control and ramp and basically monitor. Uh, so that's that. And then when we do see experiments which didn't work properly, we do roll them back and clean up the code because it doesn't make sense to just have dead code lying around. So Preeti is going to talk about uh, building diverse engineering teams. She's the director of engineering at Carta and uh, who I've all of a sudden been hearing so much about like in the last, how old is Carta now? It's like, oh, six years. Oh, really? Mm -hmm. Okay. I didn't hear about it until like a year ago, and then all of a sudden it's like everywhere. So Preeti is the Senior Director of Software Engineering at uh, Carta in San Francisco, leading multiple uh, teams based in the San Francisco Bay Area and Rio de Janeiro. Uh, her teams build products focused on small to mid-market company experiences and onboarding, law firms and valuations using leading edge technology. Uh, throughout her career as a technology leader, she has uh, believed in the motto, if you don't have a passion for people, you have no business leading them. Following this motto for many years, she's led some very productive engineering teams, mentoring and grooming other managers along the way. She also organizes and speaks at various events that support uh, career growth of women in technology and leadership, trying to break stereotypes in tech. Leading by example in every aspect of uh, the job, uh, be it iterative approach to development, always striving for better quality or de demonstrating agility towards new ideas and pivots, uh, Preeti has been able to innovate and build world-class technology platforms while recruiting and growing top talent engineers and leaders, all while juggling drop-offs and pickups of a rambunctious five-year-old. That's a lot. That's a lot of uh, responsibility. I thank you, guys. I brought a helper. With me. All right, guys. Uh, first of all, thank you so much for being here. Uh, Tuesday night, 6 p.m. is not free. 
So I get that. So thank you. Uh, hopefully, uh, from Neha's talk and mine, you will take some tips and tricks uh, with you that you can apply to your job when you get back and it'd be beneficial. So my slides going forward are going to be more interesting than this one. I just wanted to start with a clean slate and start a little bit about me and how I got here. I actually uh, grew up in India and came to the US to do my master's and joined this company called VeriSign that I don't know if many of you remember is a part of Symantec now for been for a while. Uh, that's kind of where it all started for me. Um, through that, I went on to Adobe, Climate, Premise, Ebates, multiple companies, all different shapes and sizes, and learned a lot. Went on from IC to senior engineer, tech lead, to managing you know, a full stack team, to cross platforms, and at Premise, I was heading engineering. And currently, uh, like Javed mentioned, I'm senior director of engineering at Carta. Um, Kada is a very fun and interesting company. Uh, we're a recent unicorn, uh, and it's a company that's growing really fast. And just to touch on what Kada does, um, we are in the business of helping private companies, public companies, and investors with their cap table management, equity plans, valuations, and many other services. And we are just adding on to that list. So that presents a very interesting challenge for any leader in engineering. We really need to bring in a funnel of um, a pipeline of talented engineers and none of us wanted to be from the same group. You wanted to be diverse. So having worked at all these different kinds of companies, some doing well, some failing, I have learned a lot. And that's kind of what I bring to the table um, at uh, Carta. So let's do a little exercise. If we go back to what I told you about myself, grew up in India, blah, blah, blah. There are certain assumptions you guys can make about me, right? I probably like to bake. <laughs> I must like butter chicken. Um, I am probably have a, you know, two kids, married, happy, doing family vacations. Um, must be an introvert, engineer after all. And must do this in my free time, read books like from Michelle Obama on becoming. So some of you might have thought this, some of you might not have, but what's true? I cannot bake if you gave me a million dollars. Do not like butter chicken. I do have a kid, but I'm a single mom. Do not do that. Uh, <laughs> and you can tell by now, not an introvert. And this is on my list to do, but not my most favorite thing. The thing that I actually like doing a lot is Monster Jam with my <laughs> five-year-old. That's I go there and I scream my heart out. And that's what I love doing. So the reason I did this is for you guys to see we all have unconscious bias. I do, you do, we all do. So there's no denying that. The point here is accept it and fight with it at all times. When you see someone in their 30 second elevator pitch, don't assume things about them. Give it some time, get to know them. That's kind of what I wanted to start the talk with. So, all right, so this brings us to diversity and inclusion. This is a question we ask ourselves, why does it matter? And I kid you not, someone came up to me very recently and asked me, they're just coding, right? They're sitting next to me, why does it matter if someone's writing Python code and, and they are white or African-American or a woman or a man, why does it matter? And I really tried my best to answer in as sincere a way as possible, but really what came out of my mouth was, lol. <laughs> Are you serious? Like, uh, you know, it matters. It really matters. It's not just the right thing to do, it's the smart thing to do. And there are many studies which I'll get into in the slides to follow why it matters. But the first thing is, do we understand what is diversity? You know, let's talk about that. What is it? Most of us, and a lot of companies that I've been at, we think of gender. Are you a male? Are you a female? Oh, maybe I have more males. Maybe I have less females, and that's diversity. I should increase that. Or maybe then some of us think about race, that, okay, all white male uh, counterparts, or do I have some African American, some Latin people in there? That's kind of where it stops. The fact is, this isn't it. There's a lot more to it. So let me give you some examples. 
experience. And by this, I don't mean number of years of experience. I mean diversity in experience. So an engineer, uh, uh, let's start with this. If a customer support representative wants to join engineering, does their boot camp, um, you know, does the interview and joins your team, you'd be like, yeah, okay, entry level engineer. But what they bring with them is so much knowledge about the customer, about the pain points of a customer, and they will become an asset, not just as an engineer, but as someone who can help plan your roadmaps and tell you, will this feature actually address a certain pain point? And Carta does this well. We have plenty of people who moved over and have proven to be great product managers, engineers, you name it. Age often gets forgotten. So I often use this example. If you take all your principal senior software engineers, they all have a little bit of PTSD of being in the war rooms, trying to revert that release that was risky, right? And then you take some new grads and they have that optimism and let's take this risk kind of people and put them all together in a room and something great would come out because now you have a good mix. So millennials looking at me like you guys cannot mitigate risk. That is absolutely not what I'm saying. You guys are truly lit. But I'm just saying <laughs> that just for an example, I like millennials. Uh, all right. The other thing is stage in life. What I mean by that is you could have parents like myself who are, I'm a single mom. I have to drop my kid off in the morning. There must be people who are taking care of their parents. There might be people who are going through different things. So are your policies flexible enough for people to join? Carta used to have an 8.30 start time. I would not have been able to join Carta if they hadn't changed that policy. But they have, and we are all so flexible now. So that helps bring in diversity. Last thing I'll call out here is cultural background. So this isn't just about people who are from different backgrounds joining your team, but this is about teams in, like I have a team in Rio. When you bring such cultural diversity together, you would be amazed at how much people learn from each other and contribute towards the end goal. All right, so I understand diversity now. What are the benefits? Going back to what I was mentioning about why it's the smart thing to do. Well, studies have shown that the companies that have a truly diverse uh, employee population outperform their peers. I think one I recently uh, read was from McKinsey where they were claiming around 15%, some say 30%, it's always more. So the point here is that what level your diversity is at will make a difference. They are constantly learning from each other. You know, the working style, the things that you think about, certain things are obvious to a certain uh, group and certain things are obvious to certain others. You put that together, they'll come up with pretty innovative solutions. And they'll discuss age diversity, you know, cultural experience, all that gets dis uh, discussed and you make very informed decisions. And these are happier engaged teams. Like at Carta, again, I keep using this example because I just love Carta is, we don't sit at a lunch table and only talk about baseball. We also talk about soccer and rugby and cricket because it's culturally diverse. So think about those things. So the next thing is, where do I start? How do I get my company to start towards this diversity initiative? Well, you have to be intentional about it. The burden does not sit with the five minority employees that you have in the company and they need to solve this problem. Everybody has to get involved and you have to be, well, the connection is back. Uh, so you all have to be intentional about it. So I wanted to bring an example up from Carta where we have cap tables and a real quick uh, one liner on what is a cap table. It's really a ledger of the company's ownership. Every time a private company raises money, the ownership the, gets added, there are more people, they own companies at different percentages at different point in time. So all of that is a cap table. And we have a lot of those. So we did a uh, study, Emily Kramer, who's our CMO with the Twitter Angels. And what we find out, found out was pretty mind boggling. The workforce in these companies was represented by 33% females. And only 9% equity was owned by these females. This is huge, this is fail in my book. 
this is and this is just the way we can do diversity slicing today and i'm sure no matter how you slice it and dice it this gap will only get worse so what did carta do since the study came out our ceo and our uh, people team has put together a we revamped our compensation uh, strategy we issued around 8 million in equity to our employees to bridge this gap and there's a constant effort that's going on so that's what i mean by being intentional so you need to get buy in from your executives your decision makers all the people that matter you also need to talk about it at a company level this is not a happy hour conversation this is a conversation to be had at company level top down bottom up everyone has to be bought in make it an okr you know this uh, oops i did something uh this thing about uh man is a gentleman because of the policeman that's kind of what it is so make it an okr make it someone's performance metric and the needle will move the last thing here i get i don't know if this is the last thing one of the things here is bring people to events like this i hope you did bring some of your decision makers today if you didn't take them to such events grace hopper there's so many events today actually not even grace hopper just within san francisco that can educate people about diversity so yes do you just said that man is a gentleman because of this policeman <laughs> it's just to say what did i open up this presentation with about that general bias uh as this something i it's a joke exactly actually good point exactly yeah so so i just made an assumption myself so this is the, and also what i pointed out in the beginning is we all do it you just have to be aware of it so all right so how do you hire diverse talent now we've understood a lot about diversity the way you hire diverse talent is by truly taking out the bias at the beginning of the interview process and this some i'll share some tips and tricks that carta has uh, done for us to be successful in this so the first thing look at your job descriptions are they gender neutral there's a lot of blog posts that companies like zip recruiter and other companies have posted for you to see you know what are good job descriptions if you're calling out you know a competitor spirit or being aggressive those things will not attract a certain kind of group so those are the kinds of things you need to take a look at um and then schools are you over indexing on certain kind of schools experience we've touched a lot about already so take a look at all of these things and make sure that they're taken care of and put together a diverse interview panel so diversity attracts diversity um and you know at for at there are if you have four or five people from a minority group put them up let them talk to the uh, interviewee so this people get to know that this company is serious about diversity um we also started doing anonymous assignments where you uh, we give out homework assignments for uh, in, in lieu of a technical on uh, phone screen and we submit the solutions anonymized so our people don't know uh, engineers don't know who they are uh, judging so it's it, it's worked really well and also i touched on this a little bit don't limit yourself to the five top five schools the hardest startups out there you know a lot of good talent comes out of state schools a lot of good talent comes out of companies that have failed i mean there is no saying that you know you just have to be looking for gold um one thing i want to touch here is referrals can be tricky the reason is referrals uh, do increase employee engagement but they can also play with your diversity numbers because i would i tend to you know uh, recommend people who i am comfortable with and that's what can play with it so don't discourage referrals but try to put your sourcing efforts toward the underrepresented groups that way it's a good balance um carta doesn't do this but i think i've read some companies actually pay out a bigger referral bonuses for um, underrepresented groups so that's another uh, thing you can try all right so now i have a diverse team i have been able to hire some good talent are they what do what does this look like 6 months 1 year down the line are they still happy 
you know, do we have enough good policies in place that the diverse talent that we hired is actually happy and engaged? So this is where you need to create an inclusive environment. Do not make assumptions. You might be saying things that are obvious to a certain culture and not to a certain other culture. So make sure that you don't make those assumptions. And I have an example of this actually <laughs> from my own experience. When, remember VeriSign, uh, I was an intern there, it was summer and they wanted to do a chili cook-off. And a chili cook-off to most of you here probably means what it is, is beans and meat and crock pot. And then here comes a bowl of yummy chili. To me, a chili cook-off meant chili peppers. And I am being an Indian, love chilies. And I was like, I can do this. I will get to this chili cook-off. So I, this is what I had in mind. I went to my grocery store, bought a, diff, a whole set of chilies, took my little bag, went to the to work that day, and it was not this. <laughs> now, two things could have happened here, right? The, reason, the moment I realized I was modified, I was ready to go to the Himalayas, become a saint. But thank God for my manager and for the team that was really inclusive and nice. And actually it became so the most popular station. I even won a prize and <laughs> they liked my take on the chili cook-off. So, you know, the point here is these things will happen. Just make sure that you laugh it off and make the person feel comfortable and it's okay, you know, move on. So that's the main thing I think about understanding that people have to be then you have to make them feel inclusive. And in addition to that, in let's say in brainstorming meetings, uh, what we try to do is, is leads and staff should go towards the end because people who are already not outspoken and especially if they have a difference of opinion will not speak out. Not everyone feels as comfortable as the gentleman over here. So you have to have people, you know, in some kind of encouragement for people to speak up and let them go first. Doesn't mean that seniors have a last word, just means that you express your opinion towards the end. Um, we should be careful about etiquette. A lot of times remote teams feels like this is a broadcast. You know, it's like I'm watching a video on YouTube. Encourage participation. If you have a jam board, don't put it on the other side of the screen. So now everyone in the room is looking that side and the people on the screens are looking at their heads. Move the jam board this way so you can see the body language of the people involved. Travel budget. Big one. I, as much as, oh my God, I keep doing this, sorry. As much as possible, have a good travel budget. I have a 16 hour flight to Rio, but I take it. I do leave my little five year old behind and go because people have to feel like we care for them. We are not just headquartered central company. Like I have done this. I'm going to do a, mo a lot more of this, but that's the point is to make, make them feel included. I was talking to a few people here about the psychological safety group. I started this at CARDA after my first visit to Rio because I realized that people are not feeling safe to express opinions and say things uh, that they wanna say. Some of these are controversial, some of these are not even controversial. So you gotta have some kind of place, safe place for them to speak up. Sensitivity trainings. Uh, make sure that uh, you know you have good sensitivity training around people. Again, this is a little bit of an extreme case, but sometimes it's needed. Um, the one thing I did want to, I think I'm coming to an end here, but one thing I definitely wanted to point out is if you guys know of Kim Scott, she is the author of Radical Candor. And she was at uh, CARDA the other day and said something really interesting is as a minority, are you making sure that your managers are comfortable giving critical feedback to you? If you have a new manager who's a male and his direct report is a African-American female, do they feel comfortable giving them critical feedback? Is the level playing field really, uh, really available? So make sure that it's both ways, that you, know, everybody, you need constructive feedback to move forward in your career. And lastly, communication. This is another Rio story that I like to share. I went to Rio. Uh, we were interviewing some candidates. Uh, one candidate in particular, everybody really loved. And I knew for a fact everyone liked this person. But when I'm about to put the champion mm -hmm. summary together, I see a line in there. This candidate has no opinions. 
And I thought everyone liked this person. So I asked this uh, interviewer that I thought you liked him. And he was like, yeah, I did. And I was like, but you said this, they have no opinions. He didn't. <laughs> I was able to do all different types of, uh, I was able to give all different kinds of feedback to this person. They tried all the different approaches I told them. He has no opinions. <laughs> and I was like, oh, you mean the person's flexible and the person is not stubborn and was able to try out everything that you asked them to. He said, like, yeah, he's great. You better hire him. So that's the kind of communication gap that can happen because of the way you express things. And, you know, it's, it's really bringing everyone together is truly my passion. And it's something that you have to, you know, make something that is important and make people realize it and buy into it. And, and it's really doable. All right, we're hiring. And thank you. <laughs> cool. Any questions on that? Yes. So you commented on diverse interview panels. Any recommendations on how to help those diverse interview panels with the diversity tax or the fact that they get asked to do these types of things more than other people and therefore it takes away from their jobs? You know, that, that's really, a, it's, an, it's ironic really because when we say diversity attracts diversity, but then you have, it's a chicken and an egg situation I have three people who represent the minority group. How can I keep putting them into the panel? So it's a true challenge and it gets better as you bring in more people. But what we've done, not just at Carta, but my other companies is also to reduce the velocity of this certain, if they are okay with it, uh, that, hey, for this certain team you're trying to hire right now and we would need for you to kind of, you know, help out with that. A lot of people are actually okay with that as long as it's a thing that everyone's agreed to. Um, also, you can put them in uh, low impact um, uh, sessions, which is like a culture session, maybe a phone screen. That's not a whole one hour, but it's like a 30 minute thing. Or they can just come say hi towards the end, get a coffee with them, or they are the people who, you know, do the final, all right, you know, thank you for coming and whatever. So there's multiple ways, depending on how diverse team you have and how many, uh, how much capacity the person has. Does that help? Okay. <laughs> yes. Any suggestions for starting some, uh, from scratch? <laughs> well, that's, I think, the step one <laughs> uh, is to, uh, you know, be intentional about it. And uh, I don't know if you have sourcers or if you have people who can actually uh, pay attention to the group that they are uh, sourcing. And the, the I'll share this slide, but it really helps to have a good job description that's very inclusive. Uh, there's a lot of times, it happens to me too, if I'm trying to apply for a job and I see, I get the sense that this is going to be a, you know, a bro kind of atmosphere, I will not apply there. So, you know, just to make sure that people are nice, that people are accepting, inclusive, uh, go to these uh, different events. There are a lot of diverse people there that you can chat with and, you know, promote the companies and try to get them to come interview with you guys and things like that. Yes. So I'm curious, you know, you, you just said like, if it's a bro atmosphere, you would not even try. What would keep you off? Yeah. Like what, what, what is that thing that you see in the... Oh yeah, um, that's a great... I tend to be a person, and this is not true for everyone, but for me, I really am, like I said, a culture enthusiast. I love that about every company I go to, that's the value I bring. So I have to feel that the company cares about culture. So if in a job description, I don't see a single thing that's talking about you know, collaboration or communication or, you know, it's just talking about how I need to be aggressive and prove myself and, you know, all the time, like you have to work. There is no discounting that. But what is the atmosphere you're presenting to me? And then the recruiters and, you know, it's, it's the feeling, the, the vibe that you get from the beginning, from the recruiter, from the phone screen, those things matter. Yeah, but what you just listed is basically what would put you off as well. Like, I don't think that the... No, it would, but it wouldn't put certain other, that's why. So again, how are you, and, but that's also a, uh, an aspect of diversity. Some people think that way. Some think people don't think that way, right? It's, we are all, diversity just means 
you are different in some way than a certain other group, right? And this is how you're different. You don't appreciate those things. There are people who don't care. So it, it really depends. So you don't want to put off anybody. You want to be very neutral in what kind of job descriptions you put out there. Yeah. First of all, thank you, because I, I, I appreciate uh, your definition of diversity. I think uh, it's uh, not what I expected from this talk, and I was wrong. <laughs> thank you. Uh, but just to give you an example of how tricky this can be, like in my team where we're like 20 people, we only have like one American person. <laughs> So, in the, so on my team, what, what I would like to see increasing the diversity was hiring more Americans. Absolutely. I mean, if I go to India, diversity looks very different there. You know, it's a minority group, whichever way it may be. Yes. Um, uh, this, I'm, I'm Nick. I'm curious uh, from your uh, experience from other companies, what are the, some initiatives that either you observe or, you, or you, you've driven that worked? Like, I know, maybe talk a little bit about interview, but I'm curious, like, what are the things that, yeah. Thank you. Um, I think some of the ex experiments that I have personally even done in the past is just, you know, uh, I think a similar question to what was asked before is having your presence in, in places that you will find diversity, right? And be it events, be it job boards, be it, you know, the way you approach people, your sourcers, you know, what kind of talent are they filtering on and are they paying attention to the experience in the past? So it really depends on who is your, actually a good example, who is your minority group, right? If it's white males, then that's kind of what, you know, that's the underrepresented group. Uh, so it depends. And I would say having hosting um, events where you are, you work at, or if you don't have a big enough place, then associating with skip card or, you know, people who put events like that to, uh, you know, sponsor them and have a presence in places where you would see the diverse crowd that you are looking to, um, you know, add more of in, in your teams. Yes, sir. Hi, great presentation, by the way. Thank you. Um, one thing I was wondering is how do you scalably acquire the knowledge to translate between cultures? So even in the United States, even in a small place like San Francisco, there are at least 30, 50 like different subcultures or like smaller communities. Um, and you might be able to personally experience five of those, but when it comes to recruiting, you want to select like basically the best of each. Uh, do you know any resources, books, places to go, anything like that where I can acquire such skills in a small amount of time? So um, I think internet is your friend. Um, there is plenty, there is a tool, again, I was telling some people in the beginning, there is a tool called Hofsteed.com, which is a, you can put uh, different countries in there and compare uh, across six different dimensions what to expect in each culture. I was actually just yesterday trying to do Brazil uh, because I have an office in Rio, India, because I'm from India, and then United States, we headquartered here, and kind of comparing across these six dimensions. So you can think, uh, take a look at things like individualism, avoidance of unknown things, or power uh, struggle, or so, something like that. So there's six different dimensions you can look at. Yes. Uh, Actually, I can put it up wherever these slides go, but it's H-O-F-S-T-E-D-E, -E, Hofsteed. Um, so they have a tool. And there's plenty of other resources that you can look at. Um, the other way, I think, is if you don't ha already have enough um, you know, minority representation, then it can be challenging. So uh, the story of Carter, really why there is an office in Rio. We're looking for Python engineers. And our CEO found out that there's a abundance of Python engineers for many reasons in um, Brazil and found, I think through um, Crunchbase or AngelList, one of those two uh, was able to identify people who've started companies there and reached out to uh, one of our, now one of our director of engineering and he started the office there. So partner with someone who is aware of the certain location that you're trying to go to. And as we scale, as anyone scales, those skills are needed. and Bring in people who have experience uh, doing these kinds of things. 
Sure. Yeah. I'm curious if you have any specific advice on like uh, what kind of mix of personalities do you want to on in a team to to have in a team or for example like what what kind of mixes of ages work well what kind of mixes of experiences work well uh, any examples well that's a very tricky question i think to answer and i don't think any one person has an answer to that right again i am also biased in some ways right i like nice people but that doesn't mean that everybody has to only work with nice people right it really depends on what is the need of the current team you need to really zoom in on what is available already and what's you do have to do a gap analysis right is everyone on my team really outspoken is everyone on my team really only senior engineers uh, are people only experienced in startups are they only experienced in enterprise like you kind of have to do your own assessment and then look at some of the other companies a lot of companies post data these days you know there's this is there's a big thing going on about you know uh printing out who google and everyone's doing these things so understand from them what is it that matches with your needs and learn from it so i don't think there is uh, a silver bullet for solving this problem my experience is uh, depending on where i was at uh, what size of the company was that's what we did a gap analysis a general a general thing always in engineering world is i need more you know uh, minority representation in general and that's not usually uh, white american males <laughs> it's really other people so i guess we're running out of time no, but oh okay um so i read about Let me see if I can get this right. There was a study that was saying, I think it was from like University of Colorado or something that said that when people of color and minorities will push diversity within companies, they have a greater likelihood of actually being penalized like in performance reviews, whereas when white males will push for diversity, they're not penalized. I don't know if you've run across this study before and what your thoughts are if you've seen this in in the real world. Um I I'm yet to see anyone being penalized for promoting diversity but uh I would say that like I said in the beginning that if you are putting the burden on the already small group and overburdening them with now you are responsible for these kinds of uh discussions and you're going to run this initiative it's going to be harder but you know any time a woman says we need more women is yeah great but any time a male would say yeah i think we need more women we like oh wow that guy is awesome you know so that happens for sure um the one thing i just remind my, i just remembered is there is this thing called impact funding which is really what it's about is uh encouraging female founders and you know a lot of the vc firms out there have put uh, put out some of the funding that they have to just uh sponsor or invest in women led startups and women led companies so there are avenues that are opening up out there that uh, again diversity is very heavily women and men at this point and my you know i really try to open up everyone's mind on there's diversity in many ways uh, but those are the kinds of things i think to get associated with groups that have done enough research on things like that and learn from them that's very valuable i want to point one of your biases now yeah i said we like american for white male i live and breathe the same air you guys live and breathe <laughs> so absolutely i i but i've tried and fight it as much as i can um I so by the way we are in the same situation the minority is american male uh white especially so um the oh oh okay 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 <laughs> so um uh, my i wanted to ask like a silly question what do you think about the situation of the co-working space is just open uh that was supposed to be just women focus and then they sued it and i don't know when right now is all over the place what do you think about that um, i haven't heard about that I'm not sure I don't think much about that yet but uh if I were to hear here about that I'm also uh opposed to doing you know bashing on a certain group is also wrong uh to say that you know there are plenty of nice white men out there <laughs> let's not you know uh 
many here. Uh, so the, this talk isn't about bashing on a certain group or, you know, everyone is welcome and the talent and the, it's people. Everybody should get to work together. So I would support uh, if there was a co-women only co-working space. Um, I don't think I would be a big believer in that. Um, I would, so... <laughs> My, I am, there you go, I'm a monster jam kind of girl. So everyone should have the freedom to do what they need to do and to express themselves in the way they want to express and work with whomever they want to work with. Um, so you can't fo force it in any way. So, yeah. Sorry, I wanted to add something. Um, I think um, one of the things that you said to me was extremely important. Um, you said laugh about it. Um, and I think I've learned the most diversity learning from a friend. Um, she's a black woman and she's from Morocco and she jokes about all the possible jokes that a white American man or Italian man could say about, you know, American or African uh, black women. And she laughs so much about it. And every time I look at her, I'm like, how you can you are so powerful it's so beautiful to see you laughing about things that usually people get so upset and so nervous this way i've never had a bias with her never had. so maybe once but like we have seen her we've seen each other so much and i'm like well she has all the bias for herself <laughs> i don't have to give her any other so yeah. it's it's extremely important just want to say that I used to work with Preeti. She was, she was my manager in my previous job. But I now work at Zillow Group. And in, inclusivity is extremely important. So we have various diversity groups, African American groups, Asian Pacific Islander groups, Latino groups. But you're also, even if you're not technically part of that minority group, you're also encouraged to take part in the activities of that group. And they refer to you as, as an ally. So we actually looked at statistics today, how that, how we're doing in these, you know, as far as including these people in, in, in all these people on inclusion in every year over year. And the inclusion is getting greater, but also the allies are getting greater. So each one of these groups has 20 to 30% of allies participating in their activities, going on outings with them. And they're funded by the company to, you know, to do these activities. And it's, it's important. And uh, another thing that we do is on your annual reviews, 50% of your annual review is your performance. Another 50% is how you, how you do your performance, your, how you exhibit the core values. And part of the core values is inclusivity, doing the right thing, being transparent. So I think that's one of the ways you can encourage it all the time. Um, I've only been at the company like eight months and I'm pretty amazed at what they do there. And it's not a small company. There are like 5,000 plus employees, but it doesn't, you know, you can scale this if you build the systems. Great presentation, by the way. And I would also like to say that uh, kudos to Javed for creating such a great group. I've never been in, I've given a lot of talks, but I've never been in a group where audience is so engaged and it's such an intimate setting. I'm thoroughly amazed. And what we saw here just now, and I was talking to Preeti about it earlier, a lot of times when we are doing these diversity talks, it's mostly gender, it's mostly race. What happens is it's a few women talking to other women about diversity. It's an echo chamber. What we created here today just now is a lot of diverse people actually caring about diversity and talking about it. That's what we want to do. And that happens when you put a bunch of different people with different experiences and different opinions and different take on anything together in one room and talk about something. We try to do that at LinkedIn a lot as well. And we are trying to be more mindful about it and trying to be, trying to take it towards not just like women in tech, but to be more mindful about the different dimensions that diversity cuts through. And uh, we also have something that uh, this gentleman here pointed out about, uh, so we have something like employee resource groups where we have blacks at LinkedIn, Latins at LinkedIn and things like that. And they encourage uh, people of differing opinions 
to come in and talk about those uh, options. And sometimes it's true that like you could be, there could be many of you out there in the industry, but you are the only person on the team. Like you're the only women on the team or you're the only white male on the team or you're the only man on the team. And I've seen that a lot of times uh, in my experience at LinkedIn where we are four women just talking about one from product, one from design, one from uh, engineering and uh, one from marketing. And we're like, oh, what's happening here? And one other thing that I wanted to share was, uh, so I was talking to somebody about the Grace Hopper proposal. Uh, Grace Hopper is this conference of, a big conference about women in computing. And what they are trying to solve these days is for diversity of opinion. So a proposal that was accepted was uh, submitted by uh, two of my uh, women friends at LinkedIn, and they put in a white male on that panel to create diversity. And that proposal got accepted. So that's like, you have to be intentional about it. Like where in Grace Hopper, men are diversity. We want to bring in more male allies. We want to bring in people who can actually make a difference. So you don't have to put the burden on people who are already minorities to also do this other thing. So the study that you were citing earlier, the way you penalize them is that now as part of their job, they, they have to do all the coding and everything else like everyone else, but they also have to go and recruit other diverse people on the role. So that's, it's, you're penalizing them in a way. So you don't have to do that. You have to make it an OKR and everybody has to buy in top down, bottoms up. So great, great uh, and engaging talk here. I'm thoroughly impressed.